Hello, and welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sox. And I'm Lori Sox. And today we're joined by Rob Snow, creator of the Improv and Year Method and author of the book, What I Should Have Said. Rob Snow took his love of improvisation and comedy to create the Improv and Ears, and it's really just something you have to see. Let's get right into the conversation. Yeah. Welcome, Rob Snow. Hi, Rob. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. So why don't you tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Rob Snow. I am currently in and um, I do a couple things specifically to the developmental disability community. A lot of this started back in the late 90s when I stupidly or not stupidly decided to uh, try stand-up comedy and, and improvisation. I did that in Chicago uh, for about three years. And then I stopped and got the real job, real wife, real house, real kid kind of thing. And then my wife and I moved from Chicago to Ohio, back to Ohio. I'm from Ohio. And I started doing stand-up comedy again. And so I just started doing little, you know, guest sets and open mics here and there. And, and it was just kind of fun this time around because, you know, none of it mattered. You know, I didn't care about money or a career in it or anything like that. It was just kind of fun. And at that same time, well, nine months after we moved here, we have our second son, Henry, who's born with Down syndrome. And so those two things kind of happened in my life uh, right around those same, you know, I got back into comedy and then we have this child with, with Down syndrome. And I always say the rest of my life is kind of a merge of those two things or has been up to now. And so I started writing a show. My, this was probably around 2010 that I had gotten to this point in comedy so my son was around two that started to have some ideas about what it was like raising a child with, with Down syndrome. And I wanted to talk about that in a kind of a funny way and a fun way, but in a way that, you know, could relate to the commonalities we parents share. And so I wrote a show called, called We Need a Sign, you know, a one man show. And I performed that in 2011. And I started performing that for a lot of different disability organizations around the country. And then I did a show for about bullying and things for schools. And then now it's more of a show that's more universal called Minimize the Mountain. But I would go to these conferences and kind of keynote at some these disability conferences. And I'd look at what my wife and I were doing. And we had been to the National Down Syndrome Congress Conference in Washington, D.C. I spoke at that, actually. And I said, gosh, there's so many organizations that need help here. So we created an organization called Stand Up for Downs where we were just going to put on comedy events and raise money for the Down syndrome community, uh, which we did for about five years and raised a lot of money, uh, somewhere over $500,000 um, that we were able to kick out um, all through comedy, which was kind of fun. And then uh, I was at a friend's house in Detroit and she used to perform improvisation and stuff as, as did I. And she goes, I would love to teach improvisation to individuals with special needs. And I just went, wow, wow why is, I said, why is that? And she goes, oh my God, imagine the possibilities. And I just, it blew my mind. I just was like, one, so angry that I hadn't thought of this. And two, like we talked about it. And then you start thinking about all the skills that improv builds. And I drove home from Detroit, it was three hours. I never turned on the radio. It was just this kind of music in my mind of just like, oh my God this is what I'm going to do. And so we developed, or I developed the, um, what it's called now is the improv method. And it's really taken off. We started that in 2018. The charity Stand Up for Down still exists. Half the money we raise, we kick out to organizations in the way that we had before. And then half the money is offered as kind of grants to help either organizations or individuals pay for improv and method classes. So it's been really exciting. It's gotten a lot of media attention. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what I do. 
I was able to listen a little bit to an interview that you did. And one thing that I've I found that was really beautiful about your story is that when your son was born, uh, first you were told that he didn't have any markers and that was the same thing with, yeah. with Liam. They were like, well, no, there's really nothing here that shows it. We're our neurotypical daughter. They were like, we think she has down syndrome. Do you need to do something? And so, yeah, it was am- amazing. But what I loved about your story, which I just wish for so many people is that you had a pediatrician who was encouraging and yeah. spoke words that everybody should hear yeah. and that she had a child with down syndrome. Unbelievable, right? Like I said, my first show was called We Need a Sign. You know, it's uh, if you're waiting for a sign, this is it. And that was something I came around to believing. You just mentioned something that was interesting that I would probably put in my little sign bucket. Um, your daughter, who is neurotypical, but what you were told. So you had this conversation. You know, you both probably had this conversation. Like, what if we have a child with Down syndrome? What do we do? What do we know about that? Like this whole thing. And it various emotions and things that go with that. And then she turned out not. And then your, your next one, right, mm-hmm. did have Down syndrome. But that was like a sign. You know, we had this soft marker in an ultrasound. The doctor said that might be indicative of Down syndrome. And it was like a white spot on the heart and short femurs. And then the next ultrasound, the white spot was gone. And he goes, oh, that was just a fluke, you know, kind of a thing. But I was like, we had the conversation. But the, the ultrasound really didn't show anything. It was just coincidence. And I think some of that happens, you know, in life. And I was a pretty, you know, kind of cynic. I was, you know, I'm a, a comic and um, and everything. My wife's kind of the devout Catholic. I'm the, she calls me the heathen Protestant. But, you know, for the, you know, for my wife, it's like, oh, it's a sign and it's all that. And um, and I wouldn't believe that stuff for a while. I'm like, it's a coincidence. It's just a crazy coincidence. And, but they just kept happening. And then I realized like there's, there's two lines. There's I don't even, I don't believe in these things as signs or whatever you want to call them, or I do. And then you go, oh, in this line, it means, uh, you know, you, you're on the right path, that somebody might be helping you out. And uh, all this is probably meant to be. That's a, and that's a more fun line to be in, quite frankly, because when you embrace that, it's like, it's terrific, you know? Well, I think about the conversation that you would have had about how, because I remember when, when they said for my daughter, um, I, I actually was 20 weeks pregnant and, mm, yeah. and when this doctor sat across from me and his words were, so you need to think about uh, doing something. And the window I, to terminating this pregnancy is, is closing. closing. So, you, and I was just like, I mean, and I knew Sophia's name and, and I talked to her, I'm like, wait, what? And I remember just being so like up, down, I don't care. This is my child. Right. Like, it was so like the abrasiveness of what he was saying to me. I, it, it just took me right to that we're just moving forward. I'm, I'm ignoring you. And I think that kind of attitude really served us because we got the same thing once Liam was diagnosed and it just gave us a clarity. And I think there's something about that clarity that can really bring you above a lot of the turmoil that that kind of comment can resonate. Yeah. But I love that you you had a pediatrician that was like right off the bat that you, you were welcomed by a doctor. I love that. Yeah. He walked into the hospital room and into our lives for the very first time. And we never, we never met her. And this was after one doctor, I think the delivering doctor, you know, cause I had made the comment in the delivery room. I, I said, we had a soft marker that said that he might have Down syndrome. Would we know that right now? And everyone kind of stopped and everybody who was tending to my wife now went and tended to the baby and um, they're poking and prodding for about 10 minutes. And my wife and I are like just holding hands nervously. And, and then that doctor came over and he said, okay, we're going to do some blood work, but he shows no physical traits common to someone with Down syndrome. I'm about 90% sure you're in the clear. And, you know, and that's another one of those just phrasing, right? That phrasing that doctors like you're in the clear, you know, while that, somewhat relieved us at the time, you know, knowing what I know now and as proud of the situation as we are now. It's like, I, I would not want to hear that, you know, because you're, it's immediately casting, you know, this negativity or this doubt, like you're in the clear. But anyway, we, we would say we had somewhat of a gut feeling that that wasn't the case, even though he said that. 
And then she walked in and this was two hours later and she sat down and looked at Henry and then handed him back. And she said, well, I'm about 80% sure your son has Down syndrome. And then, you know, you just feel like, you know, your heart goes to the pits of your stomach like it never had before. And, and then, she, but she immediately said, and that is awesome. And then she turned around her laptop and showed us pictures of her daughter who had Down syndrome. And it was like, I always say this in this show, Minimize the Mountain, at that exact moment that the biggest mountain of my life had fallen on us or in front of us, it also started to minimize. You know, this is one of the pieces I talk about, these, these steps to minimizing your mountain. You know, and this is po finding positivity. And, and, and she's showing us these pictures. And then also, you know, probably didn't realize at the time, but somewhat subconsciously knowing that we had this doctor who now knew so much specifically. It was a neat experience, to be honest. But of course, I've heard every bad experience, you know, from every parent out there. And it's better, you know, it is, that's the positive. This is a good time to have a child with Down syndrome, you know, a really terrific time. I mean, there's uh, trailblazers before us. You know, whenever I, I see a, a child that's 20 years or 40, I'm just like, oh, that is a parent that did something, you know. A, had the kid, kept the kid. Because that, like you said, you know, you got handed pamphlets, right? Here's abortion, adoption, institution back in those days. So it's better to the point that it's actually probably pretty good right now. I've said several times that the work we do as advocates, that it's easy to be an advocate now. Like, think of people, like you said, 30, 40 years ago, who advocated and and stood up against people in, in all different kind of ways not just disability could be race could be gender just to stand up for somebody yeah wasn't as easy back then yeah. well for back then it was standing up was just i'm gonna keep my child <laughs> right and i don't think people really understand that or they think it was a very very long time ago we were speaking with john from john's crazy socks and his dad was telling us that you know just 15 years ago, they were trying to put his son in a summer camp. Okay. The summer camp was an institution. Oh my God. And they were trying every way around it. And he wanted to go see it. And they were like, you can't because it's not a camp during, it's not this camp. Ugh. It's a different camp during the rest of the year. This is a special camp they do over the summer. And it was an institution. Yeah. And they and that was 15 years ago. I think that's what we forget. And you know, that doctor who said you're in the clear, like those were words that they used and they got away with. I, I feel like more parents are standing up and like, even in the medical community, there's so much more research and so much more conversation as to what words should be used and how we should approach this. And, and it's really about having a value in our child's life. Like they didn't even give certain heart surgeries until yeah. and it was not that it wasn't long enough ago when we were denied because it was a life not seen as worthy. And I feel like you're right. I believe in the evolution and I believe that that is, is going away. Look no further than the statistic of in the 1980s, a person with Down syndrome's life expectancy was 25. And today it's, it's 61 or more, you know, I'm no mathematician, but uh, you know, maybe in 30 years they can live to be a hundred. I don't, I don't know. And I'm not, that concerned, you know, it's, it's like, um, like somebody just came in and handed us a pamphlet from the American Journal of Medicine. And it talked about Down syndrome. And it was just awful. I mean, it was just uh, this impairment affects, you know, all these different conditions, and it would say these different conditions. And then it was like, even um, on the healthier end of the spectrum, people with Down syndrome tend to die younger in their 50s. And I always talk about that pamphlet in my show, and I, I bring it up on the screen to show people. And that. And it's like, well, yeah, it, that's, that's medical and it's, it was true, but why couldn't we on the day of our son's birth be given another pamphlet that has, has informed me now of all the amazing things. One that talked about the hugs and the smiles and the laughter, and by God, the dancing and, you know, like all these other things and talk, tell me, give me context around that shorter lifespan, you know, that in the eighties, it was 25 and today it's that. It's like, but I think that's there, you know, I just, um, I just saw the news yesterday that uh, my friend, uh, Jen Jacob, uh, who was one of the founders of an organization called the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network, and, and Jen was one of the founders along with uh, two other amazing moms, and, and it was all for those mothers 
between the ages of zero and like three. And I think it's kind of expanded now and it's, I mean, it is expanded. I mean, it was, there's thousands and thousands of, they call themselves rock and moms. And they've even started including rock and dads in there. And you go to like the NDSC conference and they are just everywhere. And these are moms that are just warriors out there that are either helping with, you know, advocacy in legislatures or talking to medical, the medical community about the proper terminologies and wording and things, you know, and, and mostly they're there to support each other, which is really, I mean, in a really powerful, amazing way. And I've just seen, th I've, you know, witnessed threads and on, on social media, of just different conversations that go back and forth that just are there to support and help. And, and look what you guys do. I mean, it's, these things are there now. And that's what, you know, you do, you look at those 30 year to 40 year old individuals and you just think about the parents and none of that was there. No. Well, to put into context, when we talk about life expectancy, I think about that this pamphlet given to you by the medical community actually shows the failure of the medical community when, yeah. when a pamphlet needs to be updated every 20 years to show another 20 years of life expectancy, right? This is yeah. because those heart yeah. surgeries not yes. being done. And, mm -hmm. and now that's something that, you know, 50% of kids about yeah. have some type of heart issue and it's fixable. And that's what we're seeing now that we're not seeing this, this infant mortality. So, yeah. um, I, and that all comes from that life being seen as equal and the medical community changing. So we have to, we have to actually I, I tip love, our hat to that. But too. I also love that it's because of our community. You know, we have Dr. Brian Scott go on here uh, yeah, yeah. quite a He's bit. Great. And um, and the one thing that he always points out is that chromosome is the same chromosome. Nothing has changed in it, but it's the community. And I think as a community, we support each other. We um, It's not what it used to be, this like cloistered, you know, person that stays in a different room and nobody talks about. It is a celebration and it's a life that that we see as equal. And so we support each other. You know, and then because of that, we create change because we're supporting our children as well. And, and we're seeing all these breakthroughs and changes. And well, then, you know, it's from the inside. And I don't think that the medical community really had a choice. Like they've, they've mm. got to like step up and meet it now. And also, I believe that a lot of the, the minds that started to come into the medical community may have been influenced by somebody with Down syndrome or with disability. Like and your just, pediatrician. Yes, like your pediatrician, right? And I think that's the change, and I think it's so, so beautiful. And I do want to talk about your improvineers. Yeah. It's fantastic. It is. <laughs> I've learned to just say, it is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very much normally, uh, I, would, I would think, and I try to be a pretty humble person, but... I, I say it like that, like it is fantastic, almost in disbelief sometimes myself of like, like why wasn't this thought of somebody before? And I'm, I'm glad that I did it. I'm glad, you know, but the proof of this thing, I used to go around and, and give presentations because the whole deal with this is the whole mission is using improvisation to build skills that will greatly increase social workplace and lifetime opportunities for those with developmental disabilities. I mean, we're talking about skills. There's, there's 10 specific skills that we really try to focus on. You know, eye contact, voice projection, quick and creative thinking, um, adaption to change, problem solving, teamwork, listening, character development, uh, and then a huge dose of uh, self-confidence. And so, you know, you can build those skills in any human. They're going to perform better. More opportunities are going to open up to them. And so when I first started it, it was somewhere in like late 2017, and we did these classes at, it was at a local Gigi's Playhouse. And we just kind of threw games at the individuals to see what stuck, you know, games that we remembered. And then, you know, I would be kind of researching games to do. It wasn't really a true thought process to it. Just like, you know, can we do this? Will it work? And it was once a month. And I remember we had done this about five months in a row. And there was an individual, um, his name was Tony. And Tony had a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. And he, you know, would really only say like three words. It's like Tony, Tiger, and yeah. And, but he was just the sweetest, you know, young man. And, you know, I just loved having him in class and we would play all these games and he would, he would participate. Um, 
but he wasn't always real physical. And again, just really those three words. And so I got a call from like the site coordinator at that, at that particular Gigi's Playhouse one day. And I was in the airport, I was in Charlotte Airport, I remember. And she goes, hey, I, I, you need to hear something. I was just at Tony's house. I walk up to the door, Tony answers the door. He gives me a huge hug, uh, which was not something Tony would ever do. He's wearing his stand up for down shirt. He's pointing to his certificate from the improv class. And he's talking like crazy. He's like, Tony wants to be actor. Tony wants to go to Playhouse Square, be actor, work in theater. Tony wants to, you know, all of this. And the parents walk up and she was just like, what has gotten into Tony? And they were like, that class, he cannot stop talking about that class. It is like, he just now has burst on, you know, with this energy and new words and all this. And I'm in an airport trying to find any corner that, that I could just kind of take this in and cry because I just had no, I was like, oh my God, it works. And that was like the first moment, you know? Uh, and then I said, what if we did this once a week? And then, so that's where we auditioned, uh, you know, the improv and ears, uh, they became the first, we auditioned like 25 individuals and um, we narrowed it down to 10, which was like the hardest thing in the world. And, uh, but they became the world's first all down syndrome improv troupe. And then we just really studied that, you know, every week, 90 minutes to, to two hours. And we did that for about two, about a year and a half. And then they put on a really big show and then a lot of media attention. But I would always talk about this show. I was, you know, during this time, I'm going around to conferences and presenting the program, not really fully understanding what it can do. You know, just kind of starting to see, you know, we're surveying, surveying the parents when we can. And they're starting to tell us these anecdotal accounts of the improvement and things like that. And so we're starting to get an idea of it. And I'm using words like, oh, this is game changing and groundbreaking. And I'm kind of using those as a little bit of hyperbole, you know, just kind of hoping that's what it was. And now I'll be in a presentation. I just, I mean, those are kind of understatements now to me. So it's really been incredible. Yeah. Well, you can go to Groundlings or IO or UCB. And I would say a third of those people that are taking classes are not comedians or actors. They're people in the business world that just want to learn these things that you talk about. In fact, improv's introduced to corporations to just have their employees learn these skills. But to move it to our community is just brilliant. But like, like I said, it just makes so much sense. Like, how was this not done before, right? It just makes yeah. total sense. Well, when our daughter, she, um, she had speech therapy and they wanted to do more speech therapy. And I was like, I'm not going to put her in another speech therapy session. I'm just not going to do that to her. I'm, and I decided we put her in improv because yeah, it's like improvisation is a kids', improv school, it's a here, kids yeah. improv school. And it was for those reasons. So studio she laugh have, out loud. Studio laugh out loud. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're so beautiful people, such great people. But you know, it was for uh, confidence. It was to practice speech, to have to be in front. It was eye contact. It was for eye contact. Yeah. It was for all the things that you say. That was the exact reason. And and it helped her in all those areas while she was overcoming her, you know, her her speech challenges. So I think it's go ahead, you're gonna say something. Oh, no. I was saying go ahead. And think of when you think of Tony, think That's, of I was gonna say I had Tony written right there. It's like how many therapies, how many things was he put into? And this is the this is what happens, and this is what we always speak to professionals and other individuals about our son whenever he goes into any situation. People probably saw Tony as three words and they were like, That's Tony. Yeah. Nobody pushed, nobody thought, nobody, nobody um would assumed anything else and because of that that was tony and that i think that is such an important thing to remember is eventually we all become what we're told we are unless we decide to be something else or someone else sees something else and allows us to grow yeah you know and and that happens with our son all yeah, the time our community is vulnerable to that i mean our our kids do need a lead you know, and they need people to believe and assume right. and actually do like this should be a part. This should be a, a curriculum that's offered over the summer 
You know, this in all seriousness, this should be a curriculum that your child can take because if you if you think about all the ways that they grow. It's interesting that, you know, you bring up that the, the C word of curriculum. I got called from uh, Texas A&M University um, a few months ago, and they had heard about the program. And there's a school there called Aggies Achieve. It's for individuals with developmental disabilities. And these two individuals run it and they have theater backgrounds and everything. So they're just like loving and going crazy over this program and they're buying it. And so that they can, um, because that's the way that we sell it now and get it out there, we license it. And then we certify the trainers, the directors, and then we actually come out and do it live. So we start, we do most of the training virtually. And then the last two uh, days of training are live, but they're not only buying the licensing and being certified themselves, they're then going to work with me to build a curriculum that they can now employ at the school. So that this curriculum can be taught to those studying special education. So I, I agree. And that's where I kind of go, you know, the, um, you know, global domination is my goal, I guess, but if we could uh, just get, because honestly, like, like you said, you know, I, I have seen, the jo jobs are terrific and, and there's a focus on jobs, you know, for individuals with developmental disabilities, a big focus, but are we going to do it in the right way? Meaning, are we going to provide jobs that meet their abilities or meet their goals and dreams in the way that we all attempt to get jobs? You know, it doesn't always work that way, but in, initially or at some point in people's lives, they try to get jobs that meet their goal or dream at some point. You know, that doesn't always happen. But if somebody, you know, this is a good example. Um, my, my right hand uh, guy is, is Nick Doyle. And Nick has become just a, an incredible friend of mine, kind of part of the family. But he uh, was one of our original improviseers and um, really stepped up as, as a true leader. And he's just an incredible, incredible story of he was working at a, at a grocery store for 11 years when he started with the Improvineers. And then he just started getting this sense of like, what am I doing here? And it wasn't, you know, a bad job, but it was a bad job for Nick because Nick is the most outgoing individual you'd ever meet. He needs to be customer facing. And the grocery store had him in the back stocking and not even bagging. And if he was bagging, that would have been better because he would have really developed relationships with customers. So now, you know, he quit and then he, he now is my, he's my national sales executive. Uh, every conference we go to, Nick is the one working the booth and offers, you know, all of our promotional things and, and, but then he's an assistant director in the program. So he's on all of these classes, whether they're, on, they're online or live as a director. And then just last year, he was named 20 under 40 in the county leadership program. It's like the first time ever at least in the state of Ohio, anybody with a developmental disability has been named to this group. He's just tremendous. He's on two boards. But so, I mean, that's like a tale that you're talking about there. You know, if we can find a way to better achieve fulfilling individuals' abilities and dreams and goals, you know, and understanding what those are. But like you said, sometimes it's, sometimes it's a pigeonholing of, well, we're going to hire people with developmental disabilities. Um, and they can, they can stack or sort or, you know, do that over there and it doesn't fit. Well, one thing that struck me about Nick, cause I was watching your videos is just his articulation. And immediately I wanted to talk to his parents about what speech, what speech support he had because he was so articulate, yeah. but his confidence. And one of the things you write about him is that the improvisation helped him to know that he belonged at the table. And I get that sense of just like ownership, like not, not apologizing or not, you know, like he was him, he was solid in everything that he was. And I just thought, I just, I, I loved listening to him talk and I loved seeing his confidence and hearing his articulation. And for me as a parent, I mean, we're big advocates, but sometimes seeing it, you go, yes, yes. Okay. There it is. And it's really, really beautiful. You talk about jobs and one of the, you know, I think it's the beginning um, jobs is a new thing, which it shouldn't be. Yeah. And the mindset of it's a favor needs to go away because the favor is what we're giving to your business. 
because like Liam is going to bring so much more to any job. And I tried to bring it down way beyond any of the stereotypes or what other people will call it. And it's Liam's ability to be present. It's really hard for any individual to do that, but to be present with someone else and to listen in that moment, so much so that sometimes I'll ask him about something for like tomorrow and he'll be like, no, and he'll just answer for like this moment. And, and it's such a gift. And I don't know if society is aware of it yet, because I think that society is still stuck in that, Hey, we hired junior, he's going to fold napkins and we're going to pay him with pizza, right? you know, and, or this is look at what this great thing that we're doing. And it's not about that. No, it's happening. In fact, I, I was happening. just thinking about how your original group of improv Oh my gosh. You had to cut down from 25 to 10, right? That's tough. And, but that shows that these 10 people that are in the group earn their spot. And they hold that, and that's going to change a lot. I wouldn't want that job, but that must have been oh, to, just to make the cut. So, no, I wouldn't want to no, do that. that must that's have been. not the job that's, I want. That was <laughs> not easy. We didn't get, you know, we the parents were great. I was really upfront, like, hey, we're treating this like a real audition. You know, there's going to be opportunity coming up, but we knew we had to just focus on this group for a while uh, before we'd understand anything. We did some other interesting things, like we worked with Doctor. Dr. Anna Espenson out of the uh, Children's Hospital of Cincinnati, and she's a really renowned behavioralist, uh, just amazing in the, particularly the Down syndrome community. She works at the Thomas Center for Down syndrome, really one of the, just the top Down syndrome clinics in the country. So Anna came on board to really advise. She's kind of our, um, kind of just an advisor to us. And she helped us create an evaluation methodology because I knew I'd have the anecdotes, right? I knew I'd have surveys and parent information. And th- those were really great because that was telling us what was happening when they left class and how it was affecting their lives. And that's really the, the nuts and bolts. But from a quantitative analysis, I did want to kind of see what we could do there. So we created this evaluation sheet, which we conduct in the third class. So our if you start taking our classes in order. Um, in level one, there's four sessions. You know, first session is 10 classes, then the next session is 10. So there's 40 classes in a given year for level one. So in the third class, so just the very third class in, we pull out the sheet and we play games that equate to various skill sets. And then we'll measure them on a scale of one to five, one being they can't really do the skill and five being they can completely do the skill. And then a year later, we measure them again and see if there's been some growth. You know, we've only had the one study because of COVID, um, which is the, the 10 individuals who took that class, the 10 original improvineers. Now we have the beginning of five studies. So in a year, we'll have roughly 50 more results. And it proved out, you know, I mean, we did, it literally proved out. People we were measuring at a, a one or a two were now threes and fours and Nick was like a five to a five plus, like he he was a five or or a four and almost everything. But, you know, but even Nick, like his assertiveness grew, his confidence grew, his leadership ability grew. So it was really, really interesting. So we knew we wanted to do that. And I think that's a big, maybe a difference to the program that we're doing out there, because I applaud and love any program. You mentioned one that your daughter's taking that uses improvisation to, or even theater programs that gets individuals with de- development disabilities on stage, you know, cause there's so much expression and voice that we want, we, we want to be able to get out of these individuals. But I think what ours does just a bit differently so far that I've seen is that evaluation methodology. We are more national in scope as opposed to like a regional theater trying to do this. You know, I, I like to think that, you know, having the improv background from like Second City and IO, like you said, Improv Olympic and some places like that. And then also having a son, you know, so knowing the community as, as well as we do and the individuals as well as we do is really helpful to the program. What I love about your program is it's set up like any improvisational school that anybody would audition for. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I went to Second City and I was like kind of terrified. And then you realize like, oh, they have what's called beginner classes 
like every program out there. You don't have to be good at all. As a matter of fact, I thought I was an incredible improviser because I took beginner classes and, you know, I did have, you know, probably better skills than most of the people in that class. And then as, you know, just like everything else, uh, as the funnel starts to go down and now I'm in like level two and I'm going, oh, maybe I'm not quite as good as I thought. These people are really good, but it's the same thing you know everybody can is going to be a part of level one and we create classes that are, are really for everyone and then there is a uh, uh, there is a talk with parents about level two we haven't exactly made it an audition into level two but there is we do make a recommendation you know uh, again we haven't had the opportunity to do that much but we've had to have talks with parents to say you know, I think they should stay kind of in this level one and just keep getting the experience and the reiteration of this. Because ultimately we do, I mean, th these individuals, the 10, they're performers. So we're getting asked to perform all over the place. You know, and, and there's a piece of me that's like, that's the piece I struggle with a little bit because the reality is I'm out there trying to show what we built. And yes, you are seeing our very best. And sometimes I struggle and go, is that fair? Is that, you know, like you mentioned equality, like, is that fair? Cause people are seeing it and going, oh my gosh. But the reality is, as I try to look at it as a parent too, I would want to see that because even if I looked at my child and I said, boy, they can't quite do those things yet. I would still look at these individuals and go, they could, mm -hmm. you know, they could look at these guys. So that's kind of where we're at with it. <laughs> And the way you talk about your experience in improv when you would see other people and go, oh, geez, these guys, right? Yeah. Or these girls. I mean, Second yeah. City has a main stage for a reason. That's what yeah. people, that's their goal is the main stage of Second City, right? And, and what you described is equality and inclusion. That's what we want. We want our kids to be pushed just like anybody would be pushed. And it's not easy, but it's fun and you learn and wherever you get to in the process, you have gifts and things that you've done on your own. And I think to be able to give that part of equality to our community is so important because a lot of, like you said, any program is great. And any program is usually a reflection of when they were born. And so I commend them and I'm so thankful for everything out there for our community that helps give them a voice, all of those. I loved your videos because one, what they bring as far as possibility to me as a parent, to our community, to our children, and maybe not every program out there is, a, is inclusive and is offered to our community, right? Or it's offered in, hey guys, here's Johnny. And Johnny's not gonna be challenged or looked at as equal or given the same opportunities or maybe given the same critiques. He's just gonna be there. He's, there. He's not going to be pushed. Uh, and that yours does that. And these individuals in the Improvineers were such brilliant. They were, they were brilliant. The little clips that I saw, they were so funny and it was such a great show, but what I loved and think that just the world needs more of, and to see more of is that audience went in there for one thing and they got something totally different and they the sh the the you changed what they thought down syndrome was the perception shift is really yes cool. because they got an idea of what maybe it really is yeah yeah and i love that well and you just you talk about this community and the community efforts you had dr scott on who did you know that terrific survey a little while ago that um it was, i think it was over they interviewed over a thousand individuals and families of people with down syndrome and you know, they asked questions like, do you feel better about your life? Mm -hmm. And it was like 79% of parents feel better about their lives because of their child with Down syndrome. And it's just such a, you know, we don't need to be told that, you know, that's preaching to the choir, but the community out there who thinks, you know, we're, we're crying at the dinner tables and we're, yeah, we, you know, just like many children, if you have a child that's in every sport in the world, you understand some of the, you know, running around that we might have to do in terms of therapies and this and that. And yeah, there's medical things that we, we do go through, of course, that may be a different or more challenging than a typical individual. However, you know, we've come to terms with that stuff. 
that's neither here nor there with us. We just, we're just committed to that piece of it. But otherwise, just being a parent, I mean, I look every day, my son's 13, and he'll be a seventh grader next year. And, you know, how many seventh graders are coming in the door? And the very first thing when we see each other, I have to, he has to be standing by the door in our mudroom. And then I have to be like, immediately across from him, but the other side of the house, and we have to run to each other. And he, he yells, where are my cuddles? <laughs> as soon as he walks in. And he jumps up and gives me just a huge hug. Um, it's every morning, every night. And like, I, I go, I'm going to have that probably for the rest of my life. You know, and I always tell him, I go, you're never going to be too cool for that, are you? He goes, no, daddy, of course not. You know, and it's just so unbelievably sweet. He says the most amazing things. I mean, he always gives us a perception change. You know, as much as I am involved in all of this, there's still more that I can go to. You know, some people will tell me, I don't even see Down syndrome in my child. And I think that's fine. Uh, I see it every day and I love it every day. You know, I, I always say like, I get to be privy, like my wife and I, we, we get to be privy, Stephen and Laura, you guys, but we get to be privy to a part of life that stays unknown to most of this world, right? We're not sad about it. We're in the club. We get to go behind the door and see something else that most people don't get to see that is really unique and special. So I think that's the best part of this whole thing. When you were just talking about the mudroom and the hugs, like, you know, and, and I think uh, honestly for a while I fought that because it's part of a stereotype that the outside world puts a little pepper on it that makes it kind of a, a cliche or a caricature or something. Yeah. I think because I don't think people can put their brains around one that we're all able to do that. Right. We are all able to walk into the door and look at any member of our family and say, where are our cuddles? Mm -hmm. right. But we forget because <laughs> life and life and the world and the challenges or our ego or our day's been hard, but we all have that ability to do that. And my son reminds me of that every day. This morning I had a conversation with a mom and she was trying to wake up her daughter and her daughter went in there with a trombone and was playing the trombone, just like, you know, and she's like, oh, it's going to be, yeah, yeah, to wake up the other daughter. She was like, ah, I'll get her up. Today, my son walked out of his room and saw his sister and went over and gave her a kiss. And I said, I love you. I miss you. And I got to witness that. And it was one of those moments where I just sat on the sofa and I was like, this is my freaking life. And there's not in a million years could I have dreamed that it would be so beautiful. And one of the biggest parts of that is something that people fear so much with all their hearts. And I, and I, you know, we know that like, we didn't know anything about Down syndrome and we felt those feelings when they first told us because of the way they told us, mm -hmm. because if, if we didn't know anything and they would have said those beautiful words of this is awesome, then that would have inferred, but it was more, you've got to come in. Yeah. We've got to have a talk. Right. I think of when you tell that mudroom story that that moment that you feel that we know you're showing the audience every show or your group is showing the audience every show. Yeah. It's funny now though, you know, I've been with them through so many performances and like we were just down in North Carolina doing a performance uh, at a, at a big event for one of their down syndrome associations. And uh, two of the mothers came, you know, because it's overnight and you gotta, you gotta have drivers, you gotta have chaperones, things like that. So uh, we got off stage and, you know, it's a standing ovation. There's like 400 people in the audience mm. and it's a standing ovation. And I go up to the other mothers and I was like, what do you guys think? And they're like, well, I mean, there's some things we need to work on. <laughs> and I go, I hear you. Cause I try to keep this, you know, bigger perspective of not just what I know that I saw, which was a B plus show. OK, but we're expecting the AA plus. But what I know that the audience just saw, they didn't see a B plus show. They saw amazement either way. And I had to tell them, both moms that I go, you got to look at this audience right now. They have no idea that, you know, she kind of messed up on the one game or she went too long while she was up there or he did this. They have no idea about that, you know. So it, it's all, it's, it's funny to me because it's gone that far. Where, I mean, if you want inclusive, you know, and you now have directors and parents who are just putting as much pressure, like got to have a good show. 
I mean, we're not really like that, but you know, we do think of it like that sometimes like, oh, they could have done better. Well, I think it's a real detriment sometimes to someone that they're, if they're just given something all the time. And that's what I find a lot of things that can happen with Liam, especially outside of school, is that things can be given like, oh, well, he did this, but let's let him do it, you know. And It kills me because it's usually other parents, you know, like if we're telling Henry he can't have something, you know, like he's gluten free. Right. And then sometimes he'll try to get away with it with a waiter or and he'll go, you can give me the full bun. And then we go, no, no. And like the waiter will obviously obey what we say. But if it's like another parent or something that they don't know, they go, oh, I can just give it. Like they'll interrupt. They'll see we're having this kind of back and forth. And then, oh, no, it's fine. He can just keep playing the video game or whatever if he's at like somebody's house. Oh, no, it's fine. And I'm looking at the parent. I'm going, you know what I'm doing right now. Like, you know, I'm trying to create a lesson here. And I know you're going to say he can just keep playing. I don't want him to keep playing. But we need that discipline to to make changes, you know? I mean, we we need it, and everyone does. So that's the way to really progress. That's why I feel like, even now, but I'm thinking 20, 30 years ago, when kids weren't pushed in school, and then they pay for it later as adults who aren't, aren't employable, and then almost blamed for not being employable when they were set up to fail. And that's what they use as, well, that's Down syndrome. It's like, no, that's a school system that failed our children. Yeah, and so to see your program where you're pushed, you auditioned for certain levels, maybe, or at least for the main stage group, right? And to see that there's goals there that, that, wow, if I work harder, I can get to that main stage group. And that's where you'll see these changes. And even when you, now you'll have 50 of them where, you know, surveys in, in, a, a, in a year where you'll see this progress. You know, ultimately it's not numbers on a board that I want to see. It's jobs on a board that I want to see. Ultimately, I want to see, you know, new and unique opportunities. You know, I look at my son and I mean, he's, he's into video games a lot, right? I mean, he's, it's hard to keep him off the electronics. That's a, that's a really big challenge of ours. But then there's times that you go, gosh, he, he truly is learning so much you know, off of the electronics. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's that battle that where we see our kids too much on electronics, but then we go, yeah, but they also really can't be behind the eight ball on the electronics game in the, in the future either, right? They, that's the future. But what I still love seeing is he'll play this game, Fortnite. He'll get out paper and he'll start drawing and writing other chapters. Or, or creating what I guess what's called skins or something like that. I guess it's outfits or different characters in the game. And, and he'll show us a notebook page after page with skins that he's created, these names of characters that he's created and, and written, you know, he's got decent handwriting and, and drawings. And it, sometimes it looks like a, you know, like a detective's board where you, there's like strings going from different pieces. And I'm just like, he needs to be hired by a video game company at some point. Game design. Yeah, he needs to be in game design. It's incredible, but you know, I love the I love the concept also of uh, you know assume competence and um, let's go beyond that. No, let, let's not just say assume competence. Let's say assume brilliance. How about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, assume creativity. Yes. Let's just do that now. Let's just, we're, I'm changing my word from competence. Assume and brilliance. Assume brilliance, yeah. You know, because that's what we do for our kids. And I think about that a lot. Like I have friends whose kids are on the video games all day. And they don't think twice. They literally just tell me it like it's nothing. But for some reason, if Liam's on his iPad, now Liam doesn't play video games. He loves movies. He memorizes movies. He loves to tell stories. He creates like, I want to do a musical called, what, not Beauty and the Beast, but Beauty and the Werewolf. And I want to do a musical. He wanted to do a Paw Patrol musical. He was like all of these, he sees musicals, he loves them and he wants to write them. But for some reason, like even though that's his passion, we get like in our head, that it should be different for our kids. And I think that there are certain things that we have to have in place, but allowing them to flourish is sometimes harder to do. Yeah. One thing that came to mind when I was first reading your story is this is just another example of, you know, we're given a diagnosis. I hope it's more your story than our story, but it's usually pretty heavy. 
and there's so many questions about what kind of impact will our will this child have on the siblings, on on our life, on our relationships, on all of these things. This is another example. I know it in our life, our son has made our life so much richer. They've he's changed me 100% for the better in so many ways, but look at what just the existence of your son has created in the world and has created in you. And on such a bigger level, you are living that dream that you had before all of this. Yeah. And it's a bigger level and the purpose and the dynamic and effect it has on the world is just, and it's not, it has on the world. It's not just what it has on our community. It has on the world. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I great words. And, um, I think about it all the time that, you know, so if I really think about it, like I did, I had this passion for comedy and I tried it out in the late nineties and kind of gave it up, but then it came back. And I, I mean, that's what I tell everybody, you know, we don't feel upset if you give up on your dreams or whatever, don't assume they're dead, you know, or gone forever. And, you know, there's ways that they can come back. You might just be taking a little, a little nap from it. Uh, and they could come back in a very powerful and meaningful way. Um, do you want to say a little about your book? Yeah, the book is so simple. It's just, you know, I wrote it pretty quick. Um, it's 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 a coffee table book or a bathroom book, whatever you want to call it. But what it what it what it was more cathartic for me. Um, it's called What I Should Have Said. And it's really just, you know, it's a collection of things that were said to us. Uh, when we had our son, uh, things that are said to people in the developmental disability community. It's kind of split up into four sections. It's kind of like the well-intended, you know, but wrong. Uh, things like, I'm so sorry. You know, it's, of course, that's a well-intended thing that people say to us, but it's completely wrong, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then there's some, there's a section of just the plain mean, like, you know, how uh, how disappointed were you when you had your child? people said that to, you know, not directly to us, but like a friend of mine told me about that, that was said to them. And so then there are a lot of things, you know, even like the R word, when people say the R word, and so many times we grit our teeth and smile politely and find the nearest exit so we can either just scream or, you know, get out of there or something. And it's my three responses of what I wish I would have said in those moments. So some are really funny. Uh, some you might find kind of mean um, or aggressive um, or too much, but honestly, it kind of covers the gamut of what we've been thinking. And then there's, you know, fill in the blank on your responses, but hopefully that's what the book does. I get, I get, I hear from people from time to time and just they'll say, oh, that book, like I started filling in my own uh, comments and things like that. And uh, so maybe there's a volume two coming on this thing, but it's just, it's fun. And I think it's helpful to those of us in the community and, um, you know, and really those outside of the community. I think the truth is cathartic. Yeah. And I think a lot of times our energy is put in as parents rising above it. I'm glad I have this one next to me because he hears all my truth. Yeah. And I think, and I think we, you, you know, as parents, it's a balancing act and, you know, we've, we've spoke with Melissa Kainach just about that, like pressure we put on ourselves to, to be this certain be thing, perfect. because if, because if we're not this certain thing, then that's what people are going to call. They're going to say, oh, they must be angry because of the down syndrome. I'm like, no, I'm just angry that you keep saying stupid stuff. Do you know? So it's, so it's that, um, daily thing of rising above and, and I know that other people's truth helps me to not judge myself so harshly. Sure. We have those thoughts. We have those reactions in our heart that just, you know, yeah, we're not going to say it out loud to them necessarily, but those feelings are valid. I was always told you have your feelings and then that's 100% human. It's just, you choose, you choose what to say and how, and how to, to respond to them. We're going to have links to the Improv and Aarons, uh, And on that website is the information I saw about online classes. And we're going to have links to Minimize the Mountain and Stand Up for Downs. That'd be great. Thank you for this equally and inclusive improv class that you've brought to our community that does just what it does for it does what it does for every human improv does. You know, you're fi you're finding the funny, which I think is really important in our community is to be able to find the funny. And you're creating an opportunity and an expectation.
And so that sets a foundation going forward that, you know, more people create that foundation of opportunity and expectation. And I love it. It's what we need. Thank you so much. You guys have put out incredible information to people and um, brought on people that are also doing really cool things. So don't underestimate your part in all this as well. So thank you. These are all bits of things that we wish we would have known when our son was born or things that we would have had or been open to. And so hopefully there are parents out there that are getting this right at the the forefront of their path and it's changing the road that they're going to travel. Thanks, guys. It was so nice to meet you. You too. Take care, guys. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod. And you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod. Or visit our website, ifweknewthen.com, to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then. Thank you.